I'm Harriet Vanceball, cardiologist and clinical trialist, and I'm so delighted to be here at AHA 2024 and welcome my friend, Dr. Mikhail Kosibarad from St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. He's here to present his exciting findings of the Realize K randomized control trial. Welcome, Mikhail. Thanks so much, Harriet. Always a pleasure to be with you. So we've had this long-standing body of evidence to support the use of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists in heart failure across the EF spectrum now, um, but uptake has been um, somewhat suboptimal. I would say across jurisdictions, around 30 to 40% of patients are on MRAs, limited mainly by hyperkalemia. Um, tell us what the rationale for your study was and what your primary objective was. Right, uh, thanks, Ariad. So uh, the rationale was quite straightforward, which is, as you pointed out, we have a class of uh, medications, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, that have been shown unequivocally to reduce morbidity and mortality in people with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction was as a cornerstone of guideline-directed medical therapy in that patient population, but is also the most underused class one level recommended treatment by the guidelines. Uh, the consistently anywhere from 30 to 50% uh, of patients with heart failure and UCF are not getting this treatment. And it's actually uh, the proportion of people who are not being prescribed is even higher in North America than it is in Europe. And uh, uh, one of the yeah, observational data suggests that one of the key reasons for that is either uh, prevalent hyperkalemia or high risk or fear of hyperkalemia, high risk patients. And so uh, the question, of course, is now with the emergence of novel potassium binders, can we potentially change that? You know, the older potassium binders were not really suitable for long term treatment because of gastrointestinal tolerability issues. The two novel potassium binders that we've seen emerge over the past few years kind of solves that problem because they're much better tolerated from GI standpoint and can be used chronically. So the question is, can you use a potassium binder uh, such as in case of realized case, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate or SEC as an enabling strategy to get more people who otherwise wouldn't be candidates for MRA treatment on optimal MRA treatment. Now we have uh, data on that for Petiromer, one of the novel potassium binders, but for as you see until now, we have not had dedicated clinical trials specifically addressing that question. Can we use SZC as an effective enablement strategy to get more patients that would benefit, presumably from MRA use, but are not being prescribed due to hyperkalemia? Can we get more of that effectively and quickly uh, on MRAs? with this uh, strategy of using a potassium binder to enable that, uh, that objective. The primary endpoint to reflect that objective was what we call the optimal treatment response. So it's essentially a percentage of patients that uh, are on optimal dose of spironolactone, which was defined as at least 25 milligrams daily or more based on international guidelines, uh, and at the same time maintain normal potassium levels and do not require rescue treatment for hyperkalemia during the randomized phase of the trial. That was the primary aim. And what's rescue treatment? Rescue treatment would be, you know, whatever we normally would use for kind of our urgent management of hyperkalemia, including as a potassium binder. Right. Now your study methods was interesting. Tell us about that. Okay, so the study was designed to uh, essentially mimic how we would use a potassium binder in clinical practice. Some of the previous trials of potassium binders uh, uh, were designed in a way that patients that were at risk for hyperkalemia were upfront treated with potassium binder even if they did not uh, actually have hyperkalemia at the time, so more like a preventative measure. But we believe that the most able to use potassium binders in practice would only do it on people who already have manifest hyperkalemia. So, we designed our open label run and face to reflect that you know, uh, typical use of clinical practice. So in order to get into the study to begin with, you had to have uh, symptomatic copper upgrade. And you had to be an optimal guideline-directed medical therapy, GDMT, except MRA treatment. So from MRA standpoint, you either had to be on no MRA 
or very low dose MRA. So uh, about you know less than 25 milligram dose of isoscurant, lactone, or other platinum, mm -hmm. which is below what the guidelines recommend. Right. And uh, there were two cohorts. Uh, so if you were in the cohort one, you already had hyperkalemia at baseline at the time of screening. And cohort two were people that were considered to be at high risk but didn't have prevalent hyperkalemia. So in cohort one, which is prevalent hyperkalemia, patients were treated upfront with SZC as a potassium binder. And then once their potassium levels normalized, they were half titrated on spiral lactone to the guideline recommended dose. And in cohort two, which were people at risk, they were first half titrated on spiral lactone. And if and when they developed hyperkalemia, they were started on the potassium binder, which is exactly how we would normally use the potassium binder in clinical practice. Now, those patients that at the end of that open label run and phase were on optimal dose of spiral lactone, 25 milligrams daily or more, and had normal potassium levels. Those were the patients that were ultimately randomized in a you know in a one-to-one -one fashion to use a continuing with their then current dose of a potassium binder and spinal lactone, or withdrawal to a match placebo, uh, uh, plus whatever the dose of spinal lactone was at the time, and treated for six months. And again, we already talked about what the primary end was. Right, so for the budding trialists in our audience, what does a run in phase buy you? Why not just randomize patients who have hyperkalemia to one strategy versus another? Right, well, I mean, there are several things that the open label run and phase gives you. One is if, if you were to simply start everybody up front, right, uh, you would miss a full group of patients that don't have hyperglemia right now, but the reasons are not an MRA because clinicians, they're afraid that they may develop hyperglemia because let's say the GFR is too low or in that range where we worry about it, or potassium levels are borderline high, or there is some other risk factor, right? So it means that an entire group of people who may develop hyperkalemia if treated with spiral lockdown, but we will never know about it because they're not even on the trial, right? The other piece is, I think the beauty of open label run and phase is that it gives you a better understanding about what the reasons are for why people can't get to optimal dose of spinal lactone because we talk about hyperkalemia being one of the key reasons, but people also worry about changes in serum creatinine and kidney functions. They worry about blood pressure mm -hmm. with uh, uh, up titration of spinal lactone. So there are other reasons that patients may not be able to be optimally treated mm -hmm. uh, beyond just potassium levels. And what the open label run and face tells you is, you know, is this really relevant concerns? Mm -hmm. Is it all about hyperkalemia or there are also other issues, other reasons people cannot get an optimal dose of MRA? And I think the only way you will know that is by doing this kind of open label run. Right. And were there any exclusion criteria based on tolerability during the open label phase by which patients were exited from the trial and not randomized? Yeah, well, if the patients could not get to the end of the open label phase on optimal dose of spread lactone, then they weren't eligible for randomization. Uh, but, uh, you know, the typical kind of tolerability things that we worry about beyond hyperkalemia uh, that are not related to blood pressure or kidney function, like gatecomastia, for example, mm -hmm. or sexual side effects from steroidal MRAs, those were exclusion criteria. So people who couldn't tolerate spread lactone because they had gatecomastia, for example, they weren't eligible to uh, enter the study even in the open label phase. Okay, uh, and how about tolerability to the intervention? Right, so um, at, at any point during open label run-on phase, if the patient couldn't tolerate treatment, right. to the point where they couldn't get to the end of the open yeah. label phase, okay. whether it was a patient decision or investigator decision, they ultimately didn't get randomized. Okay, so tell us about the randomization and the intervention period following randomization. Yeah. So again, people who were on optimal dose of Spiro, uh, so 25 milligrams or more, uh, and uh, with normal potassium levels at the end of the open level run-in, were randomized one to one. We use our SEC dose that they were on at the time, plus spiralactam dose they were on at the time, or a withdrawal to matching placebo plus spiralactam. And they were treated for six months, and they had very frequent monitoring of the potassium levels and as a laboratory parameters. Uh, and they also had protocol-based uh, adjustments, both in the SZC or placebo dose and spinalactone dose based on their potassium levels, uh, as we would normally do in clinical practice, right? When we 
uh, see changes in potassium levels, we adjust treatment. So it was uh, very much driven in a strict way by the protocol because we all know that clinicians do all kinds of things. There is a lot of variability in what people do and we wanted to have a very clear set of parameters about what do you do in a certain clinical situation so we compare apples to apples. And those dosing regimens are so important. So for the clinicians in the audience, what were the dosing regimen that was tested and how was it adjusted based on hyperkalemia? Were there a couple of doses that were used for the SCP? Yeah. So it all, and really all was based on, uh, in large part, from potassium levels. Okay. So if your potassium levels went up during randomized phase, you would initially increase the dose of SEC or placebo, and then if the hyperkalemia persisted or got worse over time, then you would essentially down titrate uh, the dose of scrotolacto. So it's really kind of, there were multiple clinical scenarios mm -hmm. we would try to anticipate what we would normally face in clinical practice. So if you look at the protocol, uh, which is actually published simultaneously uh, with our presentation, uh, you will find, you know, dedicated instructions that every investigator was supposed to follow based on those protocols. Fantastic. So important for implementation. Um, what were the baseline characteristics in the groups? Were they balanced? Anything that you'd like to point out? Yeah. So um, uh, the baseline characteristics are actually quite interesting. This was an older cohort of patients with HAPREF. So if you look at the typical half ref trial, your typical age would be like a low to mid 60s. We, our age was almost 10 years older, which I think reflects a patient population uh, that is uh, more vulnerable, uh, that has worse kidney function and higher potassium levels that we normally see in a typical half ref uh, uh, population. Uh, and uh, as I already mentioned, the kidney function was, the uh, EGFR was lower the potassium levels were higher um, uh, than what we typically see, so it's truly uh, kind of a highly comorbid and vulnerable group of people. In terms of background treatments, we had exceptional use of GDFT, and I think that's actually important when we talk about the results of the study and what happened in the trial, because many, many patients were on treatments that we'd normally consider as potentially leading to less hyperkalemia. So, uh, so nearly everyone was in the beta blocker, uh, just under 100% of people were in a beta blocker. Just under 100% of people were in an ACE inhibitor ARBO or ARD1. Yeah. And actually two thirds were on CARNI, which again is a treatment we typically think as being associated with less hyperkalemia mm -hmm. as compared to ACE or ARB. And more than 70% of people were in that GLT2 inhibitor at baseline. Again, the treatments that we typically think of potentially somehow protective uh, from hyperkalemia or potassium perturbation step one. So they were exceptionally well treated with only exception being the MRA use, of course. How about Phizi diuretics or other loop diuretics? Yeah, so most people were on diuretics, most were on loop diuretics. Uh, you mentioned any imbalances, I think that's an important point. It's a modest sized trial, so 203 people were randomized. Mm -hmm. And what happens even when you randomize patients, uh, when you have a relatively modest sample size, sometimes it could be chance and balances or differences in baseline characteristics. And it so happens that people in the SEC group were older than those in the placebo group. Uh, they had lower EGFR and substantially higher anti T levels at baseline, and more of them were loop diuretics. So um, they appear to be more severe, severely diseased patients in the SEC group from a heart failure standpoint, on average, than those in the placebo group. And sometimes that happens, as I said. Okay. So tell us the primary treatment effect. So uh, the trial was very positive in terms of uh, primary endpoint. Uh, so over 70% of patients in the SEC group uh, uh, achieved the primary endpoint or optimum treatment response. And uh, uh, about 35% of patients in the placebo group uh, accomplished uh, that primary endpoint. The odds ratio for the primary endpoint was just under 4.5, highly statistically significant with a key value of less than 0.001. So clearly, we were able to get a lot more people on optimal MRA uh, dose and maintain it with normal potassium levels uh, than people who received placebo. So we had five pre-specified and alpha-protected secondary endpoints that were tested mm -hmm. directly, and we uh, uh, met uh, successfully met four out of five of those endpoints. Okay. Uh, maybe a couple I'll mention from that list. 
uh, was stamped to the first hyperkalemia event that was reduced substantially with a hazard ratio of 0.51, and also time to first uh, discontinuation of down vibration of spironolactone was also significantly reduced with SCCBA with a hazard ratio of 0.37, both highly significant. The only secondary endpoint we did not meet was a difference in KCCQ at six months, okay. uh, which was not different between the groups. So I think on the efficacy side, we had a, quite a clear answer. You know, uh, we can get a lot more people on optimal MRA dose mm -hmm. with the use of SECs and we can see that. And what about the um, secondary, any secondary measures that you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so the secondary endpoints we just discussed, it was an exploratory, a few exploratory endpoints, and probably the one that is, um, you know, uh, to, you know, what we want to uh, mention is, uh, a composite of uh, uh, cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization to urgent visits, which were uh, adjudicated by independent events committee, clinical events committee. Uh, so as I said, it was a trial of 203 patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so it certainly was not an outcome trial and duration of follow-up was six months. So there were few events of cardiovascular death or adjudicated heart failure hospitalization or urgent visits, but uh, so there was a difference between groups with more of those occurring in the SEC groups and a placebo group. Uh, okay. There was no difference in cardiovascular death, but in terms of heart failure events, there were more of those with SECs and with placebo. You get small numbers, mm -hmm. but uh, there was a difference or imbalance in those. Uh, now, uh, uh, of the events that occurred in the SEC group, all of them were either resolved or resulting mm -hmm. at the time of the study app. Uh, uh, you know, so it probably is important to mention that, but, you know, and there are several potential explanations for that finding. Yeah, perhaps even some of the differences in baseline characteristics between the groups, would you say? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, first of all, because the number of events is so small. Yeah, could be a chance. So we're talking about, you know, a handful of things. Yeah. Uh, it could be a chance fighting, it's certainly possible. It's possible that the imbalances, the differences in baseline characteristics that we just talked about, and with kind of a more severe heart failure and characteristics, you know, the SEC group and the placebo might have contributed. But, you know, we have to also acknowledge because, uh, so SEC stands for sodium zirconium diglycylicate. Yeah. So SEC exchanges potassium for hydrogen and sodium. That may uh, result in a increased sodium okay. absorption. Yeah. Uh, and that might have contributed to that as well. Mm -hmm. It's a possibility we have to acknowledge. Uh, I will say that in the exploratory post hoc analysis, we noticed that the group of patients where this imbalance was predominantly centered were people with very high endocrine D levels <laughs> at baseline, especially those with antiprobian P over 4 out. Right. And those patients that are already quite congested and well yeah. loaded at baseline may be uh, right. actually more vulnerable. Sure. Any um, adverse events related to the drug, any intolerability that you'd like to measure? So, mention? yeah, overall, the, the numbers of serious adverse events or adverse events in general were balanced actually between goals. The only one I will mention uh, beyond the heart belly events that we already talked about is uh, the uh, rates of hypokalemia. Okay. So, there were yeah. seven events of hypokalemia in the SEC group, not in the placebo group. But we, of course, know that potassium binders can. Uh, sometimes lead to lower potassium levels, and that usually can be dealt with by reducing the dose and, uh, or temporarily stopping the medication as needed. Now tell us what proportion of people who were in the open label phase actually made it to randomization? Just to give clinicians a sense of to, you know, implementation, um, intolerability, and that sort of thing prior to randomization. Yeah. Uh, so we had roughly about 366 people, as I remember correctly, who entered the open label phase and 203 of them got randomized. So, um, you know, out of 366 people, roughly 150, 160, I guess, didn't make it to the randomized phase. There were all kinds of reasons for that. And they actually differed a bit between cohorts one and cohort two. Remember cohort one are the people with travel and hyperkalemia. Yeah, you know, cohort two were people who developed hyperkalemia after being started in spiral lockdown, so incident hyperkalemia. So in that cohort two, uh, the leading reason for not getting paralyzation is actually uh, that they never developed hyperkalemia, which actually is clinically of relevance because tells you there are 
many patients that we're afraid of studying MRAs on that can actually get optimized in MRAs, even without needing a potassium binder. I think it's of clinical importance. Of course. Um, any take-home points for listeners that you would like to finish this segment with? Yeah, I think number one kind of take-home point is that um, we uh, have an opportunity to be uh, uh, to, to really think about uh, optimizing treatment with MRAs in our patients with half rap. Again, as I said before, it's a cornerstone of GDMT to reduce its morbidity and mortality. And many patients, especially those that are at risk but don't get have hyperkalemia, would probably be optimized just by attempting to do it, right? But in those people who develop hyperkalemia, potassium binders may offer uh, another treatment option, you know, and I think we now have data with spadirimer and we have data with SEC uh, that shows that if you use a potassium binder, you can get more people on MRAs and optimal MRA dose. Uh, and clearly, realize K is uh, very compelling in that regard. That's the treatment difference was quite large between the treatment groups. When they said that's ratio of nearly four and a half. Uh, that acknowledged, uh, there are some uh, potential uh, considerations here mm -hmm. on the safety side of things. You know, you have to monitor the potassium levels. You have to watch right. for hypovolemia. And uh, what it comes to SEC, especially in people who are vulnerable and maybe most congested in particular, but overall you just, it's a, you know, you, you, there is a potential balance here between efficacy and safety and that balance needs to be factored into clinical decision making. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're doctors, uh, we have to approach every patient individually. We have to consider the benefits of potential uh, tolerability and safety considerations. And uh, there should be a shared decision making in every patient. Right. Optimized therapies decongest the patient before initiating this uh, intervention that could afford us the opportunity to optimize MRA use um, to reduce mortality and improve heart failure outcomes in our patients. Congratulations again, and thank you so much for spending your time with us this morning. We so can't it's a help. pleasure, Harris.